Hi, Henrik. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. Excellent. And uh, maybe you guys can share with us a little, little bit about uh, your background and how you got involved in, in the work that you're doing today over at the Sidonia Institute. Uh, George, maybe you would uh, like to begin. Yes. Um, I started getting interested in the uh, structures and formations on Mars in a book uh, by uh, Randolfo uh, Pozos. Uh, he had a book out in the late 1980s uh, which was titled uh, The Face on Mars, Evidence uh, for a Lost Civilization. I had picked the book up in, uh, in a bookstore, obviously, and I was thumbing through it, and I was pretty amazed. I had uh, remembered The Face on Mars from uh, when I was in high school, actually, that summer, uh, getting out of high school, graduating, going to college. It was the summer of uh, 1976 when they had all the uh, images come down from Mars and, uh, the, of course, the famous Face on Mars. But hadn't thought much about it for a long time until I saw uh, the book by Puzo. And after reading that, I was very intrigued and uh, looking at some of the other formations that I hadn't even known about in the Sedoni area. Uh, I was basically convinced from that point on that there was something extraordinary going on in the Sedoni area. And uh, was it uh, shortly after that you started your website? Or was that uh, fairly recently in terms of your research? Um, what I did initially was I uh, had a few after I introduced them to the book, and we put together a group called the Sedoni Institute in 1991. And uh, we um, eventually uh, found out about Richard Hoagland, and we ordered the uh, Monument of Mars video. And we actually at one time had uh, what we called the Mars Party, invited a lot of people over, and we showcased uh, Richard Hoagland's uh, uh, video. And uh, it was pretty interesting, and we got a lot of support. And uh, we started out as a small group, and we were basically doing research. Uh, trying to figure out, you know, what these structures were all about. Uh, we didn't have a website until much later after I met Bill. And, uh, I met, uh, and William, what, when did you uh, uh, come aboard? And what, was it uh, you who were the uh, initial uh, uh, thought behind the, the website, so to speak, and got that started? Um, I'm not exactly sure when uh, when the website got started, but uh, uh, it was after we had... Uh, George and I had met and, and began our research. I had, uh, like like George, it, um, uh, I had become interested uh, in around 1991 when I was introduced to Richard Hoagland's work, and uh, I didn't I didn't pursue anything too much other than following what Hoagland had done, and until the um, uh, Mars Observer in, or sorry, the Mars Global Surveyor in 1998. And when it released its first images of the Sidoni area, including the, the new image of the face, that's when uh, I started to uh, really become interested and started to observe some things in Sidonia um, that I perceived to be um, artificial. I'm, my background is actually in the physical sciences. I work as a um, petroleum uh, geoscience consultant, and I have uh, a background from the University of Alberta in Edmonton um, in geomorphology, which is the, uh, the um, formation of, uh, of the uh, Earth's structures. And um, so I was seeing a lot of stuff that I was trying to relate to processes on Earth, how it would form, and uh, it was very, very puzzling. I, I knew there was something that uh, just wasn't uh, fitting together right there. And that's when I met George on um, Richard Hoagland's Enterprise Mission website um, on a, a forum there. We had both been coming across things that were very unusual and, and we kind of met on that that forum, and um, and it sort of snowballed from there. And uh, I think it was within a year that we created our first website. Yeah, and when we put the website together, it was initially we it was going to be underground, and it was only going to be uh, sent to uh, other researchers to do analysis. You know, because we were trying to figure this out before we went public with anything. So basically, it was uh, for our our eyes only and other. Uh, invited guests to go look at it. it wasn't really a public website. I see, and uh, it, it seems then that you guys primarily have been focusing on the Sidonia uh, region, uh, and that's something I want to talk about here uh, later on, but I want to just ask you uh, right away here about the face actually, because to me at least uh, it seems like the, the older images we have the, of the face seems to be more uh, clear, maybe not resolution wise considering the difference in technology, but the new images that have gotten back to us uh, the face seemed almost kind of smudged. I've even read somewhere that it's been suggested that it's been 
uh, bombed or, or tampered with in, in some way. Uh, does any one of you guys want to comment on that and, and what you think the main differences are between the old and, and the new uh, images of the face on Mars? Um, I wouldn't mind um, just commenting quickly that uh, what George and I have found with these structures is that they, they um, carry multiple images and they are meant to be viewed from above but they they change their appearance uh, with with the uh, altitude. So the initial face that the Viking orbiter, or the initial uh, picture of the face that the Viking orbiter took in um, 1976 was from a thousand miles up, and it, as everybody who has seen it knows, it looks very much like a human face. But as you get uh, closer, the um, Mars Global Surveyor I think was about 250 miles above the surface and you can start to see more detail and and the, these structures uh, are very much like uh, mosaics in that they're not actually uh, a lot of the images aren't sculpted into it as so much as they are uh, like a mosaic so that when you view them from a distance they um, you can you can see what they are but as you get closer the image starts to disappear in in the detail and that's what has confused a lot of people because they're looking very closely at the face and they're not seeing what is meant to be seeing because they're they're looking too close it's like staring holding your the palm of your hand up to your eye and trying to see your your entire hand interesting point uh, george anything to add to that yes uh continuing what bill said uh initially when the the face on mars was taken uh we, I, we all tend to forget that the um, right side of the face was completely in shadow, basically. And a lot of the images that you see in the media, it's even darker, so you're basically just seeing half the face. And it does appear, uh, you know, the angle of the camera, that it did appear to be, have like a football helmet type of look to it and like a human face. And people from that point on, they had an image in their head about what the face was. You know, people were already making uh, assessments without having clearer pictures. And once we got better pictures, that whole illusion that the face was a symmetrical uh, human face, kind of looking like Frank Sinatra or Elvis Presley, it, it evaporated because the face on Mars is basically a bifurcated face, which Richard Hoagland uh, showed early on with the um, not only the Viking image, but he also continued doing the uh, duplications of the left and right side, showing the humanoid and the feline side. So people that perceive the face to be a human-looking uh, Western ideal of a symmetrical face, once they see what the reality of the face is, uh, a lot of them lost interest because it was a concept that they were not familiar with. And this was the same problem that Bill and I had early on with looking at the face. Uh, we couldn't make any you know, terrestrial connections initially until I had gone to the um, museum here in Washington, D.C. They had an exhibit about the Olmec, and I first was exposed to bifurcated mask of Mesoamerica. And I saw that the same idea that Richard Hoagland was talking about with this bifurcated face, you know, not being a symmetrical Western ideal, was exhibited in this uh, Mesoamerican art. So right from the beginning, we were making this connection with Mesoamerica being uh, showing a, uh, an analogy that we could do with these archetypes that were showing half faces in Mesoamerican art looking very similar to these half faces that we we're seeing on the on Mars. Um, we have a few images, by the way, linked up on RedEyesCreations.com that our listeners can uh, follow along in as we discuss uh, some of these features and so forth. And the first one that you guys sent me is obviously uh, of the face. So again, just to reiterate, I guess you, you guys are saying here that the uh, the two-sided aspect of, of the of the face here is a consciously, potentially consciously uh, incorporated feature, so to speak. Uh, and, and there are similarities to civilizations here on here on Earth. Uh, so is that the most clear connection right away that this is a sculptured face? It's not just a, 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 a geological uh, feature that has arisen, but it's actually a conscious, uh, consciously created uh, face here. Is that what we're talking about? Yes, and the new image that we're providing there, I guess it's image A, uh, which is the high-rise image of the Sidonia face, which was taken in 2007. Um, the face that you're seeing there, it shows great detail of the feline side, which is on the, um, the eastern or the right side. Uh, you can see the feline eye, the mane, the muzzle, the mouth, the tongue. It's got a little crown top crest at the top. On the left side, you can see the, a, 
amazing detail of the eye, which has an iris. I mean, it's uh, it's an amazing uh, feature there that the face has, showing this this human eye looking feature. So the left side is basically a human or a humanoid type of face, uh, which you're showing this duality of human and feline. Uh, NASA's taken over 20 images of the face, and what we're seeing, and what Bill could tell you also, is that this is a permanent formation. These features don't disappear uh, every time NASA takes a different picture. Uh, the features that we're seeing and that we're looking at, they're permanent. They're there in all of the images, and uh, they don't disappear with you know adjustments of light and camera angle. Uh, anything to add, Bill? Um, the only thing I would say is that uh, the, the, the structure itself, as George was saying, the features, don't change, but there is a, a uh, as I mentioned, there is a change in their appearance as you view from different altitudes and different lighting. Um, it's my contention that a lot of the structures in Cydonia are uh, will have multi uh, appearances as you as we see them at different times and different lighting. Um, if if people are familiar with the um, the the Maya Pyramid in Chichen Itza. Um, at the uh, equinox in the spring and fall, you can see a serpent being created by the shadow. The head of the serpent is a permanent feature at the base of the pyramid, and then um, at the equinox, this, the angle of sun creates the body of the snake. And it's my contention that we see the similar uh, things going on with these structures on Mars that uh, depending on the angle of the light, they, they give you a different image. Uh, do we know how big the face is, uh, let's say in miles or kilometers, if we, met, we were to measure it from uh, top to bottom? Do, do you guys know if that has been, uh, f we've, if we've found out that out yet? Yeah, well, Richard Hoagland, uh, we, we've sort of gone by his research. I think I have measured it, uh, but it's about a mile long, which is, uh, uh, you know, a kilometer, a little over a kilometer, and, uh, and a mile and a half high. And so its width would be, you know, uh, maybe a kilometer wide. Wow, that's really, really big. So uh, if we go more, I guess, in the... Uh, in the area of, of trying to find out how this was made then. Uh, do you guys suggest that this has been made by um, a, a native population uh, on Mars, let's say many thousands of years ago, or are we looking at something more uh, recent? Any theories or, or suggestions in regards to this? Bill? Um, well, I we kind of uh, subscribe to uh, Zachariah Sitchin's uh, Work. Um, he uh, his work has has documented the uh, writings of the Sumerians. His translations seem to indicate that there was a race of beings came to Earth many thousands of years ago, and they had a, a way station on Mars, and uh, they they populated Earth, and uh, pro probably uh, they are the ones that created these structures because. As George and I have found, um, the mythology, the re religious and uh, mythology of the Central Americans, particularly the, the Mayan, the Olmec, um, their uh, their artistic work of their religious uh, beliefs is almost duplicated in these Martian uh, structures. So I think that the Martian structures came first, and uh, somebody introduced these structures to the Mesoamericans, and then they created their mythology around these these structures. That's really, really interesting. And uh, uh, you guys have chosen, I guess, then to focus on this one area, the, the Sidonia uh, area. Is there any particular reason for that, or is it just the fact that the most uh, anomalies and, and uh, structures that seem to suggest uh, intelligent design are within that area, uh, or is it for any other reason that you guys chose to focus on this? Well, we, we started with the Sidoni area basically because of the face on Mars, and then in that area with, you know, from the book that um, uh, Puzo put out, The Face on Mars, Evidence for a Lost Civilization, he, he discussed some of the other uh, formations uh, um, in the area like the DNM Pyramid, so that was our focus of our attention from the beginning. Uh, like Richard Hoagland and a lot of other researchers that look at Mars, uh, 
they stayed in this one area called Sidonia because that's where the face was, and there appeared to be all these other structures in the area. And in our first book, the Sidonia Codex, uh, we just focus on the Sidonia area. But the new book that just came out, the Martian Codex, uh, the first uh, half of the, the book is dedicated again to the Sidonia area, but then we move out into the other uh, regions of Mars, finding similar uh, geoglyphic formations that also have this relationship to Sidonia and the Mesoamerican cultures. Do you guys think that there's any um, comparison in terms to sites here on Earth then as well? You mentioned obviously the Mesoamerican culture, but I'm uh, reminded of some of the uh, other research out there that, for instance, there is a uh, uh, an area primarily around Lebanon into Syria, uh, around Tyre and so forth, that is called Sidon, and they suggested that there's links between uh, Sidonia on Mars and Sidon here on Earth. Is Do you guys go into that at all, or, or are you primarily focusing on the Mesoamerican culture as the connection? I haven't heard of that relationship here on Earth, uh, but what we've been doing is, uh, you know, we haven't made any conscious, uh, uh, you know, pursuit of a preconceived agenda. You know, we've basically just followed the data. And from the beginning with the face on Mars, uh, when Richard Hoagland did his duplication of the, um, the 1998 image of the face on Mars, uh, the, the humanoid side had this tri-leaf symbol on the forehead. And a lot of early researchers were making the comparison to the Egyptians because the, the humanoid side appears to have this flange headdress. Uh, while doing some research, of course, spurred by my trip to Washington, D.C. with the Olmec exhibit, I realized or discovered that the, the Maya and the Olmec uh, use the same tri-leaf symbol on their forehead and their, um, their headdress, which symbolized corn. And it was almost identical to the one that we found on the face on Mars. So that's how we initially got into this whole idea of possibly these um, archetypes that we were seeing were related to Mesoamerica. Uh, the face on Mars, also on the humanoid side, uh, seems to have uh, no nose formation, not a strong nasal cavity or anything on that side. It's very almost looks damaged. That's why earlier you mentioned uh, that the face might have been damaged or bombed or something was altered. But we found that this the nose is basically covered by a, a nose ornament, which is another iconographic uh, motif used by in Mesoamerica. This 1998 image that we looked at also with the tri-leaf uh, symbol on the forehead, we looked at the tooth. Uh, there was a, evidence of a tooth in the front and had a little dot on it, kind of like another ornamentation. And again, this was the same type of motif that we found in Mesoamerica. And this idea of the face being related to Egyptian iconography because of the flanged headdress Again, with this research in Mesoamerica, we found that the early Olmec uh, sculptures also had this similar Egyptian-type flanged headdress. Now, we're not saying that all of this stuff is directly, uh, in one point we are saying it's directly related to Mesoamerican culture, but as Bill can attest to, through doing this research, we found that uh, not only does this mythology come out of Mesoamerica with these similar iconography that we're finding on the face, these same myths are in Egypt and they're in, uh, in the Sumerian culture. It's like a melding of these same stories that are repeated over and over. Uh, we did a lot of comparison of the mythologies in the first book uh, relating some of the stories in Mesoamerica that are very similar to stories from Egypt. So there seems to be this root story that all the different cultures use. The reason we're drawn more to the Mesoamerican culture is because it's just so blatant. And it's, I mean, they use the same bifurcated faces that the the, the two-faced mask, they do a lot of composite art. Uh, we're finding the same type of gods and uh, creation mythology that we're finding on these artworks on Mars. So it just seems easier to follow that path with the Mesoamerican connection. But like I said, these, these structures also can be found to be mimicking other cultures throughout the world, like in India, for, for instance. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, we we uh, we do uh, actually in our first book, the Sidonia Codex, we do cover a, the connection between Sidon in um, in Lebanon and the uh, basically the master builders um, who have uh, well they were accredited with building Solomon's Temple and um, they were the master builders and and their um, the, the Freemasons actually evolved out of out of that. Um, out of that, um, well, you uh, mentioned the Sidonians in the Bible. That's that's true. Yes, because we we found uh, just uh, to the west of the 
the face actually a, uh, a half um, a half glyph of uh, compass and square. When you duplicate the uh, the one side, when you mirror it, you get a compass and square. Hmm. So that uh, that was extremely interesting to us, and uh, so that kind of led us to to uh, search what the history of the the Freemasons were. Well, that's really interesting. Maybe we can talk more about that later on. Uh, Bill or, or George, if you'd like to comment on this, uh, to kind of get it off the table, I guess. Do you guys still think there is um, activity on Mars, or whoever constructed these features are uh, long gone? W what's your take on this? Personally, I think that there is still activity going on on Mars. Um, I believe that uh, there's, there's very likely um, underground um, uh, underground uh, sites where people uh, are living. Uh, now, whether they are Earthlings or whether they are the original um, inhabitants, as uh, the um, or the Anunnaki, as, um, as Hitchin says that the uh, the Akkadians called them. Um, whoever it is, um, I believe that they are still on there. I think some people, some researchers, have shown evidence of. Some changes from on the surface from um, uh, year to year in the in the different pictures that some of the craft have sent back. Uh, you know, um, if we just uh, quickly come uh, or talk more about this, I, I think that if Hoagland and together with Mike Barra, for instance, in uh, their new book, talk about pretty much the secret space program and also actually the Masonic involvement in that. That a lot of uh, the Freemasonic. Uh, rituals, so to speak, or, or planting of the Masonic flag on the moon and so forth has been going on, and considering what you guys just mentioned about the square and compass, could it be that we have Masons and Mars running around now, or, or is that is there something else going on here? Well, getting back to the compass and square that we found up there, uh, it's surprisingly right out of Mesoamerican culture also. Uh, a compass and a square, they make a circle and, of course, a cube, a square, which are uh, opposing forms. You have this duality. The symbol of the compass and square is basically the symbol of duality. And that's what we're finding in all these images, and that is at the heart of Mesoamerican mythology is this whole idea of duality, a transformation idea. So uh, we were surprised at, at first finding the compass and square, but once we were putting all the research together and making this uh, make sense, we saw that uh, the, it's the, um, a symbol right out of Mesoamerican culture, which they... Uh, some of the monuments have these circles within a square. Yes. Which is basically a compass and square, same same idea. And uh, George, do you think that there are certain Mayan glyphs, if we talk about the Mayans, for instance, that seem to be uh, recurring in the imagery that you've uh, spotted in Sidonia? Um, we're not finding any of the, the abstract glyphs, per se. We're basically, uh, the whole Maya hieroglyphic um, language that they created, you know, their glyphs, were basically made from severed heads. So that may be one reason why we're finding a lot of these geoglyphs in the Sidonia area and in other places that are these big heads, you know, like the famous face on Mars is basically a half of a human face on one side and a feline on the other. Uh, the Maya produced these masks that were with this duality, these two-faced masks, and it's also in the writing system they used a lot of heads, uh, which comes again right out of their mythology about the hero twins, and one of them were de decapitated. So this whole idea of decapitation falls right in line with their myth mythology, and it's in their writing system. So uh, this is what we're finding in the glyphs, are basically these big heads that we're finding. Uh, it's a language. Absolutely. And what, what more uh, connections have you guys found out between, between uh, Earth and Mars? Uh, does it seem to suggest, Jen, that, uh, that again, to reiterate that you mentioned that another civilization pretty much have, have potentially brought these iconic, almost archetypal images to Earth and, and simply the Mesoamerican cultures, uh, the Mayans or the Incas, Aztecs or, or Olmecs, then have uh, picked up on this, so to speak, and consequently continued and carried on with this uh, particular religion, if we can call it that. It, do, you, do you guys think that's the case here, what we're looking at? Well, it, it's hard to comprehend a, a civilization being... Uh, advanced enough to for space travel and carry the mythology that, uh, or you know, seriously consider the mythology that we have, uh, you know, that the Mesoamericans uh, considered with all these different um, deities that represent uh, different things. I myself, I don't think they're uh, 
they're reality-based uh, belief systems. I think they're symbolic. Um, George has made a lot of discoveries in, in the connection with the agricultural uh, uh, gods of Mesoamerica and the, um, and the changes in, in uh, the seasons and that sort of thing. And George will probably be able to speak more about that. Comments, George? Well, th- this whole um, mythology started with the Olmec. Um, there was a lot of controversy between archaeologists uh, with the Aztecs and the, the Maya camp and then the Olmec followers. Uh, when the Olmec culture was initially discovered, um, they didn't know what to do with it because it didn't fit into the, um, the storyline that the... Um, the archaeologists were putting together with the history of the Maya, who were supposed to be this peaceful people, and they were just stargazers. And, of course, the Aztecs were the evil ones that were later that were doing the sacrifice. And then they were thrown out of whack when they discovered all this Olmec culture. And uh, a lot of early archaeologists thought the Olmec were uh, just an offshoot of the Maya, and then they came to the realization that the Olmec were actually, uh, you know, thousands of years before the Maya. And this whole mythology that the Maya have that we can understand and read because we have a lot of text and a lot of uh, iconography to in, in vases and things and stellas and monuments to read, unlike the Olmec, which is very limited. The more artifacts we're finding of the Olmec, uh, just a couple of years ago they had a big exhibit and a, a talk and, uh, called the Maya Weekend up at the University of Pennsylvania about the Olmec uh, influence of the Maya. And basically, the Olmec are the mother culture. That's where all the information came from. The Maya basically just took everything from the Olmec and made it their own, kind of like uh, where the the Romans took all the mythology from the Greeks, you know, that type of adaptation. Yes. So but we're finding that the Olmec are the root. And then, like Bill was talking about our discussion of Zechariah Sitchin, supposedly Ningasada went down to South America with his favorite... Uh, a group of humans that they made called the black-headed people, which many think were the Olmec, which are very, they have a lot of negroid features, that they were down in Mesoamerica. And possibly this connection with the Olmec and the ancient Sumerians and the Anunnaki, this is where this whole mythology comes from that was bestowed onto them from uh, the Anunnaki. That's why they, uh, their whole history is basically the same that we're seeing mirrored up on, on Mars. I mean, that's all we can come up with. I mean, we basically we'd have to go there and get our feet on the ground to find out actually what's going on. But we're just interpreting what we're seeing in these images, and to us it just seems uh, to be overwhelming that there's this uh, correlation between the artwork in Mesoamerica and these structures on Mars. Absolutely, and uh, could it be also that some of the or more evidence rather for this could be uh, the fact that most of these geoglyphs. Uh, aren't uh, seen, so to speak, uh, until we get up in the air. Uh, we didn't discover some of these features until we had balloons, airplanes, or even later uh, satellite photography. Could that be an evidence that these people uh, who, who made the glyphs actually were airborne? Uh, George or Bill, any comments? Well, I think, uh, yes, you, you would have to be. The, the technology that has gone into creating these structures, because uh, there are multiple images within uh, these structures and they're not and they're at all different angles and they're at all different uh, um, sizes that is viewing viewing distances uh, as you zoom in or zoom out um, um, and and rotate the the structure different images appear so the the knowledge that went into creating these things is very very high and the creation of them was very high tech so it's not a primitive culture who built these. Um, it ha- and the fact that they are so large and that they have to be viewed from um, from high up, it, it's obviously it had to have been a technologically advanced people who did it. Absolutely. And what about if we talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the mirroring aspect, so to speak, of this as well? Uh, many of the faces will have to be mirrored or d- reduplicated in order to get, get them whole or they're partial. Uh, the idea of mirroring half faces like that, is that um, acceptable in terms of, uh, uh, if we look at it from an archaeological perspective? Yes. Um, archaeologists use uh, mirroring uh, in their research with Mesoamerican uh, artwork, uh, especially Chavan art down in uh, Peru and things like that, which, like Bill was saying, it, 
the, some of the structures we're seeing on Mars have these multiple images in them. Uh, you see the same type of motif and artwork down in South America in the Maya culture, uh, images within images, uh, the same idea. And um, archaeologists will use uh, a mirroring technique, but they don't call it mirroring. They'll call it duplication or reconstruction. Uh, they shy away from using the word mirroring. Uh, when people hear mirroring, of course, they think of a uh, raw shark test, and it's just a bunch of uh, you know, silliness and trick of light. But this is an actual uh, scientific tool that the archaeologists use, and we list in the, in the new book uh, many archaeologists that use this technique, but again, they call it duplication. So when we're mirroring anything in the new book, we, we use the phrase duplication. Now, the reason some of these things are just half images, uh, this again comes right out of Mesoamerican culture. There's a lot of sculptures and um, uh, jade figurines that are just uh, half of an image, just half of a figure half of a face. Uh, this idea comes from um, a ceremonial um, process when the, the lordship of the, let's say, a certain town of, let's say, Tikal, uh, when the lord dies and they put him in the tomb, what they would do, take some of his personal artifacts and cut them in half. Like, let's say, he had a jade figurine uh, of one of the gods. They would slice it directly in half and bury one half with him in the tomb, and the other half would stay in the upper world. So you'd have one half of the, the spirit in the underworld and one half in the upper world. So this whole idea of things cut in half is, again, right out of Mesoamerican culture. And Bill and I have found numerous uh, half-face images, not just like the face on Mars, which is a bifurcated face. We found other formations that are just half. Very interesting. And uh, what do you think the, the primary... Um material, so to speak, is here that they've been using? Did they use the, the sand or the, the earth that is available around, or could it even be that it's a rock formation there already, and they, they simply uh, pile up material on top of this in order to, to uh, get the, uh, the, the necessary features? Well, that's what we uh, surmised uh, at first, was that these structures were, were originally in pl place, and they, uh, and they were just altered to create the um, the images. However, uh, from what we've seen in other places um, on Mars, not just in Cydonia, there definitely appears to be, and I'm speaking in particular here about uh, um, the parrot that um, I think George has presented you with a, a picture of that, um, where it appears that there has been excavation and, um, and then creation of, you know, um, a structure from from that material. We originally figured that this was all rock. However, uh, some of the um, some of the instruments that NASA has used to to survey the Cydonia area, they um, they call the f um, the features uh, enigmatic. Um, the material is enigmatic. In other words, they can't identify it. And uh, that, that's right uh, regarding the parrot formation. I've, uh, we have an image of that if we look at the second one that we received from, from you guys. Uh, and what about, uh, you know, why not? Why isn't this a, a natural uh, feature? And the, the fact is that we just, we spot this with our eyes, so to speak, and, and uh, the brain do, does the rest of the work, so to speak, and we fill this in. Is there any other evidence here that seems to point towards the fact that this is a created uh, feature? Well, the, geologically, the, uh, the body and the... Um in the tail, uh, the feathering uh, pattern that you see in the body and the tail, um, f at first glance, that looks like uh, the the strata created by an incising stream that you would see in uh, in a canyon such as the Grand Canyon, uh, where you, whereas the stream cuts in, it it leaves a different layer of of rock. However, that's the only feature the the body and the and the tail of the parrot. Is the only uh, structure that shows evidence of any incising uh, fluvial erosion. Um, the totally surrounding, the features surrounding are all anomalous to each other. There is no evidence of an incising stream on the um, on the um, material above the parrot, or to the side, or to below. And the um, you can see just below the parrot, you can see uh, the duned, rippled. Uh, appearance of the of the surface, which is uh, where uh, a sea or um, 
a marine area was um, was originally in place. The there is a huge um, impact crater to the northeast and and or is it the northeast or southeast, George, of where the parrot I think is? It's, I forget. It's, well, the parrot's upside down, so it's probably north. Um, so there was we've inverted there was, it. Yeah, that, so there was uh, uh, water there at one time. There is definitely evidence of water in place, but not of incising uh, uh, fluvial action. Hmm. And then uh, George will speak to the um, the um, uh, veterinary side of things. Yes, go ahead, George. And, and uh, if you, you you can mention if you had uh, any experts uh, we, been looking at this. And hopes, we're looking at the parrot, uh, I guess, image B. Uh, we sent uh, this image uh, electronically and then uh, 8 by 10 glossies to uh, three veterinarians, uh, one in New Jersey, one here in Virginia, and uh, one in uh, Ohio. And the one in Ohio, uh, Dr. Susan Oros, uh, she's an uh, avian specialist, so you know she knows uh, what a macaw and parrot looks like. And uh, as a group, they came back with, uh, are, are you sitting down? 18 points of anatomical correctness in this bird. Hmm. which goes way beyond chance. Uh, they're talking about the beak, the lower jaw, there's the tongue feature, the eye, the head, the different uh, texture from the head from the body. Uh, there's the, uh, the little foot down there that has all the joints in the right place. Uh, at the top of the bird, there's this, uh, the fluting or the, you can see the, the feather shafts. Uh, it's just amazing. They, they were actually blown away, and they were well aware that they were looking at something that was on Mars, so it wasn't like we were trying to send them something and uh, fool them. Uh, the other anomaly on the bird, you'll know, there appears to be, they didn't know if it was some type of waddle or, or what that was. Uh, my interpretation uh, following the Mesoamerican model is that that's probably a, a dart from one of the hero twins who, going again back to the Mesoamerican mythology, uh, the uh, bird, the principal, principal bird deity, uh, occupied the uh, world tree he sat at the top of the world tree and he had stolen the sun according to the mythology very similar to the American Indian story of the raven I don't know if you're familiar with American Indian stories of the, the black raven stealing the sun yes, yes same idea right well the Maya had a similar story with the hero twins that the seven macaw which was the principal bird deity he also stole the sun and uh, who knows how shot his blow dart and hit him in the jaw right where this blow dart just happens to be on this parrot formation Hmm. on Mars, and he fell down to the Earth, and of course they retrieved the sun. But uh, we just find it amazing that uh, finding all this Mesoamerican stuff with the two-faced uh, motifs, and then we're finding this full image of a parrot that just happens to have what appears to be a blow dart stuck in his jaw. And uh, the parrot is still within the uh, Cydonia uh, area, or is this elsewhere on Mars? No, that is in an area called uh, Argiri. Uh, basin, the Argiri Basin. Mm -hmm. It's in uh, another part of Mars. This is actually uh, when we decided to move our research beyond the Sidonia area. This, yeah, formation, this is quite far south. Right, this is in the southern area of, of Mars. Uh, again, right next to a large water basin, which NASA's uh, photographed many times, and they've actually taken three pictures of this parrot, and it uh, it retains its formation in all the different pictures, so it's not just something that's a trickle of light, and we only have one image. This image that we presenting to your uh, viewers here and your people on the radio. Uh, this was just released this summer, which is, again is another interesting story with NASA. Uh, when Bill and I were on Coast to Coast Radio, when our uh, first book, The Sidonia Codex, came out back in 2005, we appeared on Art Bell's Coast to Coast with George Norrie on August 22nd. And that very day, uh, Mike Malin, uh, which runs the, the NASA photographs, release of them, and he also he's the one that runs the camera. Uh, Michael Malin on his website release he puts out an image of the day. Uh, he's been doing this for years, and usually those images are like from the last six months that have come down from the Mars Global Surveyor, and he'll put an image up, and it's like you know, the image of the day. Uh, well, the interesting thing is this image was taken in 2002, and the night that Bill and I were on coast to coast, uh, he put this up as the image of the day, the same day we were on coast to coast which we thought was kind of interesting, considering we had uh, sent him a request to take another picture of this formation uh, through a friend of ours, Jim Miller, who's also part of the Sedoni Institute, another colleague of ours, because we wanted uh, to get a comparison. You know, Bill being a geomorphologist, of course you wanted to get 
uh, the analysis so he could look at the different strata and see if this was uh, a legitimate formation or it was just a trick of light. So we did get that second image, but the interesting thing about the date of our, uh, August 22nd, uh, this summer on August 22nd, 2009, this image here was just released uh, by a friend of ours, uh, Keith Laney, who actually works for NASA uh, doing some of the enhancements for them. So I don't know if this was type of uh, some type of uh, tradition that they were doing, or uh, but it's kind of amazing that the new image was released. A little nod. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this new image uh, shows the entire tail, whereas uh, the image uh, when we discussed this in the book, we don't have this image available, and the tail is truncated, and we just surmise that there there is a, a full tail, and sure enough. Um, right after our book is released, this picture is released showing the full tale. How about that? That's really interesting. And uh, do you guys primarily look at images from NASA or, or do you look at other space ag agencies and their uh, material uh, as well? Well, we've been looking at uh, mostly NASA images, the Mars Global Surveyor, Viking, and uh, the, the new high-rise, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, the ESA, the, the Mars Express, the, the British or the European uh, project. They've released a lot of images. However, uh, they seem to be highly uh, creative in their releases. They're uh, false color and they're very low resolution. They're mostly released for uh, public uh, um, campaign, you know, for public relations. They're really not anything that's scientific that we can look at. Uh, what do you think, Bill? Yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't spent any time looking at those. Um, I have been focusing on what yeah, there's such an abundance of material from from the Mars Global Surveyor. A person couldn't look at it all in their lifetime, uh, and you know, and study them for for the types of things that we're looking for. So uh, that's that's where my main focus has been. Mm. And uh, again, uh, Bill, if you can talk a little bit about this, uh, why a civilization would want to create uh, these gi giant artificial structures that kind of blend in with the natural natural geological formations. Uh, in this way, do you think that that's again is because it's uh, it's easy and some features might be there already and they just have to fill fill that in, so to speak, or or do you think that even uh, location of some of these uh, sites are of importance as well? Maybe even correlation between one image and another image in another place. Thoughts? Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, there is, there has been found. Uh, well, Richard Hoagland initially did a lot of uh, research on the placement of the structures in Cydonia. He came up with a mathematical um, picture of um, exactly how these structures are related in, in their positioning and their different angles. And interestingly enough, he came up with many um, Masonic numbers, uh, things that, uh, that numbers that are very important to uh, the Masonic uh, belief system. And um, I, I don't know why they are hidden. Um, it's, it's very interesting. One thing is that to put multiple images together in a structure, you can't have complete images. Um, it works best to put multiple images if you only have partial images. Um, and why they're hidden, I don't really know. Um, it might have something George, to do with the Popol Vuh. Well, yeah, George, uh, maybe you want to talk about that. Well, uh, again, it seems that everything we're finding here explaining uh, the, the reason that we're finding these structures and, and their, um, their, uh, the, the companion faces on different areas of, of the surface. Mm -hmm. um, the Maya, their creation mythology was based on what they called the Popol Vuh, which was basically the Maya creation story. And the Popol Vuh, uh, the original book of the Maya, uh, according to uh, scriptures, was written long ago, but its site was hidden from the searcher and the thinker. So right from the beginning, the original uh, book that the Maya based their creation on was hidden. Hmm. They just don't say and, why it was hidden. Right. And we made some uh, speculation in the first book about this idea of a, of a great book being hidden from the searcher and the thinker, uh, where... Zachariah Sitchin talks about Marduk, who was exiled from Earth uh, because you know he had the rivalry with his brother and he wanted to be the, the ruler. But 
uh, you know, he was such a bad boy, they had to get rid of him and they put him on Mars. And we speculate a little bit in the first book that possibly when Marduk was uh, exiled to Mars with the, with the Iggy, he had had them create all of these pictographs all over the surface of Mars while he was there because he had nothing better to do. And that was a blasphemous act against his father because his father had bestowed the sacred uh, writings and everything to his brother. So when Marduk uh, had access to this sacred knowledge, he put basically the mythology of the world on Mars, which was uh, what the Maya saw as the Popol Vuh, this, this lost book, this hidden book that nobody could see because it was, you know, nobody knew where it was. And possibly the existence of all these geoglyphs all over the planet that we're finding out. Initially we thought these were just focused in Sidonia area, but they seem to now be all over the place, is that possibly Marduk was creating this uh, holographic book and Mars is basically this uh, Popol Vuh that was lost. Do you think that that could be for us to be found, so to speak? That it's a it's a message here that when we arrive, uh, technologically speaking, in a in a time where we have the ability to see this, that's also the time when we're supposed to <laughs> to find the lost book, so to speak. Right, like Hoagland had said, the face on Mars was a calling card, saying, "Hey, look at here," you know, and that's what we found first. And then uh, through his studies there, he found this you know sacred geometry that he was finding in all the layout of the the structures. And this whole concept of, uh, you know, human beings or whoever these people were building structures that are to be viewed from above, again, you have in North America, the American Indians down in South America, some of the actual cities in South America, the Peruvian cities are in shapes of alligators or birds. Uh, the interesting thing we found out about this, this parrot, uh, there's the first city that the Maya built, uh, mentioned in the Popol Vuh, was shaped like a parrot. Hmm. And we have a picture of that in the book. And down in Peru and South America, you have cities that are constructed in the shapes of a puma, of a, uh, a llama, of alligators, and things like that. American Indians uh, made all these mounds. You have the serpent mound out in uh, Ohio. So this, it's a tradition that uh, you know these ancient cultures, for some reason, built these uh, these geoglyphs on our planet that could only be viewed from above. Now, most people are familiar with these ancient cultures that built these. Um, uh, uh, landforms, these earthworks that can only be viewed from above. Uh, while doing this research in the first book, uh, as recently as 2001, they discovered a huge half of a face geoglyph down in uh, Corral, Peru. This was just discovered. Uh, there's a whole um, um, influx of archaeologists down in southern Peru right now for the last five, six years uh, digging in this area called Corral, Peru. Uh, and they're dating it. The carbon dating is going way back. It's even rivaling with the age of the pyramids in Egypt. Hmm. It's going back uh, almost 3,000 B.C., which is pretty startling. Wow. And it's right next to that, those ruins that they found this half-faced geoglyph. And we have a picture of that in the first book. And again, that's just a half of a face. Just like the things we're finding on Mars, we're finding a uh, parallel here on Earth. Really interesting. And uh, guys, we have much more to discuss obviously but I want to begin to round things up here for the first uh, hour and maybe uh, one of you can mention a little bit about more about your website what people can find if they go there and of course how to uh, get uh, uh, copies of your uh, your books as well well the website said uh, like you said it's uh, the Sedonia Institute all one word the Sedonia Institute dot com on the website we have uh, numerous articles that uh, either Bill or I or we have written together and uh, there's up about our appearances and information on the website where your uh, listeners can order the book. Uh, the book can also be ordered directly through the Sedona Institute at uh, P.O. Box 102, Percival, Virginia, and that's area code 20132. And uh, they can send us a letter about some information about it. Hi, Henrik. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. Excellent. And uh, maybe you guys can share with us a little, little bit about uh, your background and how you got involved in, in the work that you're doing today over at the Sidonia Institute. Uh, George, maybe you would uh, like to begin. Yes. Um, I started getting interested in the uh, structures and formations on Mars in a book uh, by uh, Randolfo uh, Pozos. Uh, he had a book out in the late 1980s, uh, which was titled uh, The Face on Mars, Evidence uh, for a Lost Civilization. I had picked the book up in, uh, in a bookstore, obviously, and I was thumbing through it, and I was pretty amazed. I had uh, remembered the face on Mars from uh, when I was in high school, actually, that summer 
uh, getting out of high school, graduating, going to college. It was the summer of uh, 1976 when they had all the uh, images come down from Mars and, uh, the, of course, the famous face on Mars. But hadn't thought much about it for a long time until I saw uh, the book by Puzo. And after reading that, I was very intrigued and uh, looking at some of the other formations that I hadn't even known about in the Sedoni area, uh, I was basically convinced from that point on that there was something extraordinary going on in the Sedoni area. And uh, was it uh, shortly after that you started your website, or is that uh, fairly recently in terms of your research? Um, what I did initially was I uh, had a few, after I introduced them to the book, and we put together a group called the Sedoni Institute in 1991. And uh, we... Um, eventually uh, found out about Richard Hoagland and we ordered the uh, Monuments of Mars video and we actually at one time had uh, what we call the Mars, like a football helmet type of look to it and like a human face. And people from that point on, they had an image in their head about what the face was. You know, people were already making uh, assessments without having clearer pictures. And once we got better pictures, that whole illusion that the face was a symmetrical uh, human face, kind of looking like Frank Sinatra or Elvis Presley, it, it evaporated because the face on Mars is basically a bifurcated face, which Richard Hoagland uh, showed early on with the um, not only the Viking image, but he also continued doing the uh, duplications of the left and the right side, showing the humanoid and the feline side. So people that perceive the face to be a human-looking uh, Western ideal of a symmetrical face, once they see what the reality of the face is, uh, a lot of them lost interest because it was a concept that they were not familiar with. And this was the same problem that Bill and I had early on with looking at the face. Uh, we couldn't make any you know, terrestrial connections initially until I had gone to the um, museum here in Washington, D.C. They had an exhibit about the Olmec, and I first was exposed to bifurcated mask of Mesoamerica. And I saw that the same idea that Richard Hoagland was talking about with this bifurcated face you know, not being a symmetrical Western ideal, was exhibited in this uh, Mesoamerican art. So right from the beginning, we were making this connection with Mesoamerica, being uh, showing a uh, an analogy that we could do with these archetypes that we're showing half faces in Mesoamerican art, looking very similar to these half faces that we were seeing on the on Mars. Um, we have a few images, by the way, linked up on Red Eyes Creation. Stuff that I was trying to relate to processes on Earth, how it would form, and uh, it was very, very puzzling. I, I knew there was something that uh, just wasn't uh, fitting together right there. And that's when I met George on um, Richard Hoagland's Enterprise Mission website um, on a, a forum there. We had both been coming across things that were very unusual and, and we kind of met on that that forum, and um, and it sort of snowballed from there. And uh, I think it was within a year that we created our first website. Yeah, and when we put the website together, it was initially we it was going to be underground, and it was only going to be uh, sent to uh, other researchers to do analysis. You know, because we were trying to figure this out before we went public with anything. So basically, it was uh, for our our eyes only and other. Uh, invited guests to go look at it. It wasn't really a public website. I see. And uh, it, it seems then that you guys primarily have been focusing on the Sidonia uh, region, uh, and that's something I want to talk about here uh, later on. But I want to just ask you uh, right away here about the face, actually, because to me at least, uh, it seems like the, the older images we have the, of the face seems to be more uh, clear, maybe not resolution-wise, considering the difference in technology, but the new images that have gotten back to us uh, the face seem almost kind of smudged. I've even read somewhere that it's suge been suggested that it's been uh, bombed or, or tampered with I in some way. Uh, does any one of you guys want to comment on that and, and what you think the main differences are between the old and, and the new uh, images of the face on Mars? Um, I wouldn't mind uh, um, just commenting quickly that uh, what George and I have found with these structures is that they... they um, carry multiple images and they are meant to be viewed from above but they they change their appearance uh, with with the uh, altitude so the initial face that the Viking orbiter or the initial uh, picture of the face that the Viking orbiter took in um, 1976 
was from a thousand miles up, and as everybody who has seen it knows, it looks very much like a human face. But as you get uh, closer, the um, Mars Global Surveyor, I think, was about 250 miles above the surface, and you can start to see more detail. And and th these structures uh, are very much like uh, mosaics in that they're not actually, uh, a lot of the images aren't sculpted into it as so much as they are uh, like a mosaic, so that when you view them from a distance, they um, you can you can see what they are. But as you get closer, the image starts to disappear in in the detail, and that's what has confused a lot of people because they're looking very closely at the face, and they're not seeing what is meant to be seeing because they're they're looking too close. It's like staring, holding your the palm of your hand up to your eye and trying to see your your entire hand. Interesting point. Uh, George, anything to add to that? Yes. Uh, continuing what Bill said, uh, initially when the, the face on Mars was taken, uh, we, I, we all tend to forget that the um, right side of the face was completely in shadow, basically. And a lot of the images that you see in the media, it's even darker, so you're basically just seeing half the face. And it does appear, uh, you know, the angle of the camera, that it did appear to be had already invited a lot of people over, and we showcased uh, Richard Hoagland's... Uh, a video, and uh, it was pretty interesting, and we got a lot of support, and uh, we started out as a small group, and we were basically doing research, uh, trying to figure out, you know, what these structures were all about. Uh, we didn't have a website until much later after I met Bill. And, uh, I met, uh, and William, what, when did you uh, uh, come aboard, and what, was it uh, you who were the uh, initial uh, uh, thought behind the, the website, so to speak, and got that started? Um... I'm not exactly sure when uh, when the website got started, but uh, uh, it was after we had uh, George and I had met and and began our research. I had uh, like like George, it, um, uh, I had become interested uh, in around 1991 when I was introduced to Richard Hoagland's work, and uh, I didn't I didn't pursue anything too much other than following what Hoagland had done, and until the um, uh, Mars Observer in, or uh, sorry, the Mars Global Surveyor in 1998, and when it released its first images of the Cydonia area, including the the new image of the face, that's when uh, I started to uh, really become interested and started to observe some things in Cydonia um, that I perceived to be um, artificial. I'm, my background is actually in the physical sciences. I work as a um, petroleum uh, geoscience consultant and I have uh, a background from the University of Alberta in Edmonton um, in geomorphology which is the uh, the um, formation of uh, of the uh, earth's structures and um, so I was seeing a lot of